Hi, everybody. My name is Nir, and I run the Applied Ethics Center at UMass in Boston. And I am very, very pleased uh, this Boston afternoon and Scotland evening and whatever else is automated out of the discussion to um, host uh, Shannon Valor as part of our uh, Artificial Intelligence and Experience uh, series. Uh, Professor Valor is the Bailey Gifford Chair in Ethics of Data and AI at the Edinburgh Futures Institute, uh, which is at the University of Edinburgh, and she is also appointed in uh, the philosophy department there. Her research explores how new technologies, especially AI, robotics, and data science, reshape human moral character, habits, and practices. Her work includes advising policymakers and industry on the ethical design and use of AI, and she currently chairs Scotland's data delivery group. Professor Valor received the 2015 World Technology Award in Ethics from the World Technology Network. She's a former visiting researcher and AI ethicist at Google, and in addition to her many article and pub articles and published educational modules, on the ethics of data, robotics, and artificial intelligence. She is the author of the book, Technology and the Virtues, a Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting, which if you haven't read, you should read. And uh, also the forthcoming lessons from the AI mirror, rebuilding our humanity in an age of machine thinking. So Shannon, thank you so much for um, uh, speaking to us today, and I will uh, hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Nir. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, glad that uh, we're able to, to do this uh, despite the uh, constraints of, of the pandemic. And um, while I'd love to be uh, back in uh, Massachusetts in person uh, again uh, one day soon, uh, this, will, this will be uh, a good substitute for now. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and um, Go ahead and going if that works. Okay, is that uh, showing up for everybody? Excellent. All right, so this talk is uh, called Thinking Outside uh, the Black Box, uh, because what are we academics if we don't make uh, overly clever titles uh, for our work? Um, but this is really about a what I call uh, the shrinking space of moral reasons and the relationship of AI. Uh, to that space. Um, this is actually a uh, kind of revisiting of a, of a, of a talk that uh, is based on the first chapter of my second book, the one that I am currently writing, The AI Mirror, the one that has been repeatedly delayed by uh, all number of, of traumas, not the least of which is the pandemic. Um, but that pandemic and, and all the other delays have given me time to let this work mature a bit. So I'm kind of looking forward to going back to some of the early ideas and, and deepening them. And I'm uh, hopeful that our conversation after the talk uh, will allow us to um, dig into this in a really substantive way uh, that perhaps I uh, haven't yet had the opportunity to do. So, um, I'm going to kind of give a little prelude here, and then I'll dig into the meat of the of the talk itself. So, oh, and already, okay, there we go. So uh, this is a a tweet that I saw about three years ago uh, that, that kind of cracked me up. Uh, oddly enough, I um, I worked it into the talk. And then uh, I actually met this person. Coincidentally, I ended up working uh, with them uh, a few years after that. Um, but uh, the, the tweet says, my dad just told me he makes decisions now by emailing himself a potential plan and reading Gmail's su suggested auto responses to it to determine if it's a good idea or not. And the thread continues, if Gmail says, that's a plan, you know you're on to something. Um, so, I mean, obviously there's uh, uh, just some, some humor here, right? But it, it kind of, I think, points to the way that technology increasingly promises, or at least those who develop and, and uh, uh, promote it uh, promise, uh, that these technologies will increasingly offload 
many of our uh, cognitive responsibilities and particularly uh, responsibilities uh, that involve decision-making uh, that carries increasingly important and um, elevated stakes. So uh, the kinds of decisions that were being encouraged to offload to algorithmic uh, systems um, or other decision support technologies um, are becoming increasingly significant uh, in their impact on our lives and on the lives of others. Um, so I don't think there's very many of us that are uh, currently uh, making our life plans according to um, a, a Gmail, uh, but increasingly we are seeing that um, who we choose to hire uh, or who chooses to hire us, uh, who gives us a loan, uh, who uh, rents us a, a home, um, who we date, um, who we remain friends with. Um, these, these decisions are increasingly uh, being shaped uh, by our technologies in more and more active ways. And my talk is about the consequences of that. So here's a philosophical uh, provocation. Um, the quote is, it's a profoundly erroneous truism that we should cultivate the habit of thinking of what we are doing. The precise opposite is the case. Civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. Uh, I don't know if anyone here knows uh, where this quote is from or who said it, um, but it's Whitehead from an introduction to mathematics in, in 1911. And I think it's an important provocation for us today um, because of course Whitehead here is thinking about the way that um, that mathematical reasoning as it grows in uh, sophistication and development allows us to, uh, in a sense, uh, routinize and, and offload a, a number of increasingly sophisticated cognitive operations, uh, which can then be uh, reconfigured as calculations. Um, and the difference between calculations and deliberations or decisions, I think, is an important one. And today, I think uh, we would uh, imagine that many of the uh, leaders of technology companies in Silicon Valley would embrace uh, this quote in a different context uh, and encourage us to extend the number of important operations that we can perform without thinking about them because we have machines to do the thinking for us. So one question I want to ask is, what thoughts do the civilized keep? So if civilization extends uh, and grows by enlarging the range of cognitive operations uh, that we no longer have to perform, uh, what are the thoughts that are left within the scope of civilized uh, human company? So here's a bunch of questions um, that arguably many of us can easily uh, avoid uh, thinking about today already. Uh, what's the weather outside? I can ask Siri. Uh, I can pull up my phone. Where are my keys? If I have a locator beacon uh, on my keychain, uh, that is uh, a problem that can be uh, solved without any kind of reflection on where I've been over the course of my day, for example. Where can I get a good steak? When is my mother-in-law's birthday? How much is 49 divided by three? How do you spell ubiquitous? What's the designated hitter rule? These are all things that uh, I think increasingly the civilized uh, have already decided are uh, unnecessary um, uh, burdens of cognition. Even are we out of toilet paper uh, can, be, can be answered for us uh, today. Okay. But what about uh, some other uh, ways of, of thinking about this? Um, what about these thoughts? What is a fair outcome of this decision to grant a loan or not, to grant bail or not? What does this child need? Uh, think about uh, the number of uh, child services agencies uh, that are uh, increasingly using algorithmic decision support systems 
uh, to allocate resources. Uh, I myself uh, have a, a, an active partnership with an organization called the Data for Children Collaborative uh, that's part of UNICEF uh, that is, is a using um, data-driven uh, technologies uh, to identify both uh, where children in need are and what they need. How can I treat this person with respect? What does beauty look like? How should I spend my days? Does this person deserve their freedom? Who should lead us? Should this person be allowed to live or die? If you think these questions are safely outside of the space of algorithmic decision making, you're mistaken. Um, each of these are questions that in one way or the other uh, are already moving um, into the space of machine thinking, uh, which leaves us again with that pressing, pressing question. What are the thoughts that the civilized keep? Okay, so that's my prelude uh, and my motivation for the talk. Uh, so let's dig into the, uh, the meat of the talk itself. So it'll have uh, these sections. Uh, I'm gonna talk about um, uh, the, a kind of background setting uh, of the problem a little bit further. I'm going to uh, talk about why I'm talking about the space of reasons and why we should care about it. I'm gonna talk about uh, what I mean when I say that AI is driving a contraction of the space of moral reasons. And I'm going to talk about how we might make moral space in AI-driven decision systems. Okay, so let's start uh, then uh, with the introduction. So um, much of today's media obsession with AI and the power of algorithms uh, obscures the fact that algorithms as a finite series of steps for generating solutions to uh, a gig given cognitive problem are, are nothing new to human society. Um, so the term, uh, goes back to uh, you know, ninth century uh, late medieval Latin and uh, refers to the earliest mathematical procedures for counting addition and division. So it long predates modern computing practices. But modern computing has invested today's digital algorithms, especially those embedded in AI-driven and automated decision support systems with vastly expanded social power. And as I've said, these algorithms increasingly constrain and shape what we read, watch, and hear online, who we're invited to meet or date, what medical treatments we're advised to undergo, who will hire us, how the justice system will treat us, and where we're allowed to live. Further social constraints and influences from AI and decision system algorithms are projected in almost every sphere of culture, governance, and commercial activity. And since new mechanisms of social power are always philosophically significant, we should not be surprised to find that these developments raise a host of important political, epistemological, and ethical questions. And among them are questions about the opacity of the social mechanisms uh, that depend upon these new computing techniques. For it's become increasingly challenging to understand exactly when, how, or by whose authority these algorithms affect their profound influences on our lives. And this slide here talks about the various causes of uh, uh, AI opacity and concerns uh, about it uh, that have already been uh, widely articulated in the literature. Um, so this lack of transparency and what we could call a, a black box society, to borrow the title of Frank Pasquale's uh, excellent 2015 book on this subject, raises profound ethical questions about justice, power, inequality, bias, freedom, and democratic values in an AI-driven world. And the problem's especially complex given the multiple and overlapping causes, proprietary technology, poorly labeled and curated data sets, the growing gap between the speed of human uh, decision-making and machine decision-making, and the inherently opaque and unpredictable behavior of many uh, machine learning systems, especially those involving uh, deep learning processes, which may prevent even their programmers from fully understanding the system's internal operations uh, uh, or uh, reasoning and uh, also impedes assessing its reliability and safety in complex interactions with other social and computational systems. Okay. But my focus today is an aspect of the transparency problem that's not yet widely discussed among philosophers and other academics uh, or in media and public policy circles. And this is the prospect that the growing opacity of AI systems and their uses 
and may result in a severe and ethically, ethically troubling contraction uh, of what philosophers have called uh, the space of moral reasons. Um, okay, so uh, sorry, I skipped this uh, uh, slide by mistake, but uh, this is just kind of an overview again of the different kinds of AI opacity that we're already confronting um, and, and some examples of it for those of you that uh, may not uh, be familiar with this literature. Um, but what I wanna talk about again is this space of moral reasons. Okay, so what is that? So many of you will be familiar with Sellers, Wilfred Sellers having uh, invoked this notion of a logical space of reasons um, in 1956 and, and later Robert Brandom's elaboration uh, of this socially constructed space. So Brandom says, knowledge is intelligible as a standing in the space of reasons, uh, which is constructed and negotiated in this way um, and uh, supported by various uh, reason giving and reason accepting practices. So um, John McDowell and others have extended uh, this uh, concept to uh, the domain of practical ethics, uh, which holds open a space of moral reasons in which moral agents are invited to act. I'll also note that uh, after uh, writing this, this chapter um, a couple of years ago, or at least starting it a couple of years ago, um, I, I looked around to see if anyone had uh, really introduced this idea of the space of reasons into the AI ethics discourse, didn't find anything. Uh, and just recently saw an article in Philosophy and Technology by Heinrichs and Nell that relates the concept of the space of reasons, uh, not the space of moral reasons specifically, but the space of reasons generally uh, to AI agents. Uh, so it's a reminder that if you don't get your uh, book uh, published, someone will eventually scoop it. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think it's uh, actually a, a really rich trove of um, philosophical connections to explore. Uh, but I'm going to focus uh, more narrowly on uh, the space of moral reasons. So what do I mean by that? So uh, the space of moral reasons can be understood in a couple of ways. It might be seen uh, as a cognitive space in which a moral agent enjoys the psychological freedom to reflect upon morally salient facts, values, possibilities, principles, consequences, and ideals that might inform and motivate his or her actions. Alternatively, it can be viewed as a public space in which morally salient facts, values, possibilities, principles, consequences, ideals, etc., can be entered into a moral discourse, one that can inform and motivate the decisions of moral agents within a given community of actors. And finally, one can fuse the psychological and public conceptions and see them as mutually constitutive elements of the context within which moral agents are enabled uh, to choose and act together. In all of these formulations, oops, sorry, apologies. Uh, in all of these formulations, the metaphor of space is intended to represent a temporally and discursively open yet structured horizon of moral thinking and choosing uh, that allows an agent to assume responsibility for his or her moral action to be potentially responsive to moral reasons communicated by other moral agents or to other new moral information in the agent's environment and to be capable of morally justifying her actions to herself and others. Preserving the space of moral reasons has also been characterized as an essential way of being at home in the moral world, of seeing moral phenomena as an inextricably meaningful feature of one's life and the life of others. Thus the space of moral reasons can be threatened by a range of causes uh, that make it harder for humans to be at home with moral thinking. Historically, these threats have ranged from authoritarian ideologies that encourage us to leave the task of moral thinking to our God or our leaders, all too often presented as a package deal, to cynical jaded philosophies in which moral thinking is seen as mere politics by other means, or perhaps the wasted effort of the hopelessly naive. Fortunately, history also contains in its pantheon of great souls, many voices of resistance to these threats, philosophers, theologians, activists, artists, many others. Philosophers will cite the golden age of Athens and Rome, the enlightenment era in Europe and the civil rights era in the United States as times in which the space of moral reasons had to be defended and held open, but there are many more stories of resistance to be told. 
Today, we face a new threat to the space of moral reasons and a need for a new kind of resistance. Sorry, my slides are behaving very strangely today. Okay. So what is this space of more reasons and, and why should we care about it uh, more specifically? So we've already said that the space of more reasons has both a cognitive dimension and a public dimension. To unpack these, we have to understand uh, what we mean when we say that the space of moral reasons is a metaphor. While a person's moral reasoning does take place within a well-defined physical space, that is in one's spatially extended brain, and public moral reasoning takes place in physical and virtual spaces of its own, these are not the kinds of space that we're referring to. Using the spatial notion of extension as a metaphorical bridge, we can understand moral reasoning as a process that's extended in at least two other ways, temporally and discursively. Now, the temporal extension of moral reasoning is easy to grasp. It takes a duration of time for a human to reason about anything, but moral reasoning in particular is time dependent. First, consider those theories of moral psychology that emphasize two distinct timescales and associated co cognitive mechanisms for moral decision making. The fast mechanisms of moral analysis, as posited by Haidt and Kahneman, are driven not by explicit reasoning, but by emotionally laden social intuitions that produce rapid and motivationally compelling judgments. Whereas the slow mechanisms of moral analysis are higher order, but often motivationally weaker processes of conscious moral reasoning that allow for careful considerations of the strength of evidence, logical coherence of argument, and consistency with norms or ideals to which one is explicitly committed. I don't think we need to delve into the ongoing scholarly controversies about the merits or fine-grained implications of this two-tier model of moral decision-making. Even its defenders, who are often justly criticized for giving the personal and social force of moral reasoning too little credit, acknowledge that explicit slow moral reasoning is important and healthy uh, uh, for society. Um, Jonathan Haidt has acknowledged in a debate with his critics that quote, reasons matter, reasons produce movement, end quote, in social mores, even if he continues to insist that the emotional ground of the debate must first be cleared of opposing fast intuitions if this moral movement is to happen. Moreover, Haidt celebrates the norms of reason giving and responsiveness to reasons that define slow moral reasoning processes. He says, I wish such norms could be sprinkled into the water supply in Washington. Moral reasoning then of the type that observes the norms of evidence sensitivity, logical coherence and consistency, reason giving and reason responsiveness takes time. Both clock time, because moral reasoning happens more slowly in the brain than does moral intuition, and experienced time. That is, it requires that we perceive ourselves as having an open horizon of time to think things through, to contemplate, to ruminate, to consider, compare, locate, inspect, and trace the relevant connections. Imagine yourself deciding to actually sit down and really think hard about a profound moral problem in society or in your own personal life. Now imagine someone uh, setting a running timer on the table. It doesn't really matter if the timer has 60 seconds on it or five minutes or 15. You might have only needed a few minutes to reach a sound conclusion, but your perception of a closed and inflexible temporal horizon will disturb and confound the moral reasoning process anyway. This temporally extended horizon intersects with the discursively extended one. Of course, there's the trivial fact that the temporal space of moral reasons is increased during moral discourse with other people or groups because I have to wait for my reasons and evidence to be considered by others, for my objections to be answered and for my interlocutors to articulate their own reasoning, evidence and objections. Yet even when moral reasoning is done by an individual sitting alone, it's still a socially mediated discursive process. For the reasons that we're drawn to consider insofar as they concern moral life, that is life with others, always have a social context. The language of moral thought thus always projects social, political, cultural, and epistemological distance between my reasons and the reasons of others. To reason rightly about moral matters, I have to conceptualize and remain acutely cognizant of the spaces between what I have, know, believe, need, want, and feel, and the often very different things that are had, known, believed, needed, wanted, and felt by the other humans involved in the moral situation I'm reasoning about. This is why narcissists are generally terrible moral reasoners, 
They can't readily perceive such spaces and discontinuities between themselves and others or grasp their importance. The space of moral reasons then is a temporally and discursively extended space in which moral thinking can, so to speak, stretch out and do its work, both in the psychological and in the public context. It's also been represented as offering a way of being at home in the moral world, as I've said. Preserving a sense of myself as a moral being requires this space to be held open for me. For otherwise, I might act morally if my fast processes of moral intuition are sufficiently reliable, but I will not have consciously assigned these decisions or actions a place in the moral narrative that anchors the sense of myself as a moral being, a creature who confronts morally significant things in the world and makes deliberate efforts to respond to them in moral ways. For a virtue ethicist like me, it's obvious that preserving space for moral reasons, both cognitively and publicly, is an essential prerequisite for the acquisition of practical wisdom or phronesis, and it's a critical component of moral self-cultivation in general. The holistic understanding of the field of moral community and one's particular place in it that Aristotle, Confucius, and the Buddha all saw as required for ethical virtue cannot be obtained without sustained opportunities to practice stretching out one's mind and speech with others in the space of moral reasons. The space of moral reasons also enables essential features of moral functioning in society. First, it allows an agent to assume responsibility for his or her moral action uh, and for others to confidently attribute responsibility to her. As noted above, the space of moral reasons allows us to place our moral decision-making within a personal narrative to take ownership of it. There is of course a kind of moral responsibility that we attribute to a person who has voluntarily done something wrong but cannot even in retrospect say how he or she arrived at that decision. Yet there's a hollowness at the core of this kind of responsibility that disturbs us. See every police procedural ever where the detective presses the perp who has just confessed with an insistent, but why did you do it? The space of moral reasons also allows us to be potentially responsive to moral reasons communicated by other moral agents or to other new moral information in the agent's environment. As long as the process remains extended, there's time for new or revised moral information to be entered at any stage, allowing us to back up and make the necessary adjustments to our assumptions, values, and inferences. Even an extended moral judgment that's been concluded can be revisited, retraced, and modified with hindsight just as I can re retrace the steps of a hike I made yesterday and take an improvised detour. Or as Haidt, Kahneman, and others note is often the case, I can take an earlier moral decision I made on the basis of raw reactive intuition and use moral reasoning to expand it, to give it the extension and volume that it originally lacked. In many cases, this is done simply to invent a convincing fiction to assure myself or others that I had good, well-considered reasons for what I did but it can just as easily be done with remedial intent to give a quick emotional decision, a careful moral audit when time allows, allowing me post hoc insight into the ways in which my raw moral intuitions serve me well or poorly or serve others well or poorly. And finally, and related to the uh, previous observation, the space of moral reasons allows me to morally justify my actions to myself and others perhaps even more importantly, allows others the reasonable expectation that they may demand such justification from me. If I've not been allowed the space to think about what I do in the moral realm or what my society does, I can't offer any reliable evidence that I or my society should have done it or should continue to do it. If most others in my society are equally foreclosed from the space of moral reasons, then both I and my fellows are left at the mercy of moral luck if we're to have any hope of a good life together. And in general, we're ill-advised to leave our fortunes to luck if we have any reasonable means of steering them well. Okay, so then let's get back to AI and talk about uh, what I have called an AI-driven contraction of the space of moral reasons. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to take a little a detour uh, into one of my favorite preoccupations, uh, namely science fiction. So in the 1955 short story franchise by Isaac Asimov, we meet Norman Muller, an office drone with a clerky soul, I love that phrase, who in the story's imagining of the year 2008 is selected by Multivac 
the artificially intelligent arbiter of American democracy to represent the electorate in choosing the next president of the United States. By means of an impressive body of calculations opaque even to multivax human handlers, the supercomputing computer multivac has determined that in this particular year, it is the very ordinary mind of Mr. Norman Muller of Bloomington, Indiana that can provide it the best window into the collective will of the electorate. As multivax system administrator, John Paulson perfunctorily explains, by interviewing Muller, multivac will be able to declare with great mathematical precision the winning presidential candidate, just as multivac declares with unassailable predictive accuracy the result of all elections, national, state, and local. And of course, given multivax predictive power, quote, elections aren't the only thing it's used for, end quote. Yet Mueller's role in the election is not to express to multivac his own personal judgment of who ought to be president. That would not be a democracy after all, but simply the rule of one. Rather, by posing to Mueller a series of seemingly arbitrary questions about matters as banal as the price of eggs, while monitoring Mueller's biometric data alongside his answers, Multivac calculates, quote, certain imponderable attitudes of the mind, end quote, characteristic of the American voter at that precise historical moment. Knowledge of these imponderable attitudes, when combined with the trillions of other pieces of data known to Multivac, allow it to compute with great accuracy what the total vote count of the American electorate would be had the election taken place. In the story, we're not given any express reason to question multivax predictive powers or its security from tampering or corruption. Still, the system administrator repeatedly emphasizes to Mueller their shared civic duty to maintain secrecy about the details of the process so that the workings, especially the human parts, are insulated from outside pressures. Multivac then is part of an algorithmic decision system that involves many human technicians and administrators, as well as human inputs like Norman Mueller, yet which is massively opaque. This opacity is reinforced on multiple levels. First, the computational power and knowledge base of multivax simply exceed the grasp of human thought by a great magnitude. Second, the system architecture and internal logic of multivax AI is not isomorphic to human reasoning. After all, by what inferences would you discover, uh, would you use to discover the imponderable attitudes and minutia of someone's political mindset by asking them what they think about the price of eggs or whether they quote, favor central incinerators, end quote, to name another question that Mueller has asked. So Multivac is, is getting at uh, this, uh, this prediction through a, a completely unrecognizable and, and alien path to, to human reasoning. Nor are the scales of judgment comparable. Multivac performs a statistical analysis of correlations within a massive pool of data about virtually all known facts whereas human voters are by nature of our cognitive limitations far narrower in our knowledge and reasoning. Finally, the overarching algorithmic decision system of which multivax algorithm is a central part is largely obscured from public view. In the story, American voters know that multivax calculates the election results on the basis of an interview with a single representative individual, but the details of how multivax conducts the interview and how the results are calculated even to the limited extent that these are understood by the human system architects are tightly kept secrets of the national security infrastructure. So Mueller uh, uh, um, uh, is uh, uh, interfacing with a machine that even its operators have only a sort of vague notion as Asimov says of the general plan of relays and circuits that had long grown past the point where any single human could possibly have a firm grasp of the whole. Uh, and it should be uh, probably obvious to many of you that uh, I think there are already uh, compelling parallels, uh, not between the capabilities of Multivac and the capabilities of our, of our uh, AI systems today, uh, but between uh, the AI uh, systems we have today and the kinds of opacity uh, that Asimov already anticipated uh, as uh, surrounding a system uh, like multivac. Eight years after the, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, many more years than eight, um, I have to do the calculation in my head, what was it, 2008, right? So 13 years 
after the date of uh, Asimov's projection, American elections are still carried out by individual voters, uh, albeit with the help of uh, Russian hackers and Macedonian teenagers cranking out political fiction and fake news farms. But each of the forms of opacity that Asimov envisioned in franchise exists in AI-driven uh, decision support systems in wide use today. Most critically, those computational systems dependent upon deep learning and unsupervised learning machine algorithms, which pose special difficulties for reliable human interpretation, validation, and auditing. AI decision support systems today are used to identify terrorist threats and targets in voice, image, email, social media, and SMS data, to assign risk scores to defendants in bail sentencing and parole evaluations to determine where and when law enforcement personnel are most likely to encounter certain crimes or to diagnose cancers and recommend personalized treatment plans. Other systems calculate how likely you are to fit into the corporate culture and remain with the company to which you've applied or how close a match a stranger is to your romantic preferences or how likely you are to repay the business loan you're seeking or the chances that your kid will thrive at a selective private school. These are the sorts of decisions that govern how well or poorly our lives go. Yet in none of these systems can the average user, or in many cases, even the system regulators, programmers, and administrators, grasp precisely how the decision process is being carried out or what salient factors are driving the algorithm's results. In the franchise story, we're led to question how the political franchise of the voter can possibly be preserved under such conditions of algorithmic opacity. But we must notice that one of the most disturbing aspects of the franchise scenario and our present reality is the contraction in the space of normative reasoning that it fosters, both in the personal and the public domain. Norman Muller has no cause to explicitly think through his own political judgments. First, because he assumes that he will never be the one American chosen to be directly consulted by Multivac, any more than any of us assumes we will be the one to win the Powerball lottery. And second, because even when he is in fact the one chosen, Multivac does not need to explicitly ask him for his personal opinions about politics or the good of the union, much less ask him to account for these opinions with reasons. On the public level, there's a similarly superfluous character to political discourse in the franchise story. It still happens, of course, insofar as politicians still campaign and voters still form opinions, but the causal link between explicit public reasoning for those opinions and the final vote even the political need for explicit public reasoning is obscure. Do the voters perceive any need to persuade their neighbors or even to account for the reasons behind their own opinions when Multivac can correctly predict everyone's votes by entirely indirect and opaque means? In the story, the background assumption is that Multivac's predictions are, if not perfect, at least as accurate as the tallying of millions of actual human votes and far less costly and cumbersome. The same sort of justification is given for the use of AI decision support systems in human institutions today. No one thinks that any computer operating today can actually grasp the moral, legal, or political gravity of drone targeting decisions, sentencing recommendations, or even loan decisions, much less reason about them. But if an AI system can make decisions that are just as reliable as those made by humans who do reason about them, only faster and more cheaply, then the logic of efficiency invites us to let the reasoning drop out of the process as a now unnecessary human excrescence of analog decision-making. It doesn't help that the present quality of public reasoning and decision-making as evidenced on Twitter and Facebook and traditional venues such as Congress and Parliament invite the consolation of cynical despair. Maybe humans are just not cut out for moral and political reasoning after all. And at this point, how much worse could the machines really do? But what do we lose by giving into that logic? First, we lose those pub public and cognitive spaces for reflection upon our actions and their moral status. Consider the example of predictive policing algorithms, which are increasingly marketed by vendors as using the power of AI to deliver new data-driven insights, to use their business speak, about patterns of criminal acti activity. The Chicago Police Department, uh, until uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, used a, a tool called the Strategic Subject List, generated by an algorithm that determines the risk that a particular individual will be a victim or perpetrator of gun violence. 
Persons who rank high on the list received a precautionary visit from a police officer and or social worker offering assistance. Now let's set aside legitimate doubts about the effectiveness of the algorithm and its use by CPD, uh, which eventually actually led to its discontinuation. The algorithm's lack of transparency remains a grave issue, and not just because these technologies are being used in other cities, such as New Orleans, without public notice or discussion, thanks to back channel arrangements between the tech companies and agencies that bypass city councils and other elected representatives, because even when the use of this system isn't secret and there is an opportunity for public debate, it's stifled by the inherent opacity of the algorithms themselves. As ACLU representative Karen Shelley noted, quote, we don't know all the factors that can put someone on the list. And the Chicago Police Department hasn't made public the algorithm they use to put people on the list, end quote. Since the algorithm's proprietary, neither the police officer nor the social worker making the home visit can know how the person got on the list nor can they explain the system's reasoning to the person they're visiting. This means that there's no basis for any of them to reflect on the quality or justice of the reason for the interaction. For example, because it's, because whether, for example, whether it's because the resident has a long criminal history or just happens to live in a poor neighborhood or lives in a, a wealthy neighborhood but has many police contacts for driving while black. Now, were the algorithm transparent and public with clear weightings for each risk factor or combination thereof, officers using it or members of the public might be invited to reflect upon the relative legitimacy or fairness of those different reasons for intervention. The results of those reflections might then be shared and debated with relevant parties. Likewise, a more transparent process gives the person receiving the visit a rational basis for reflecting upon its value. Should they welcome it and take it seriously? Should they dismiss it as a nuisance or police harassment? Should they make some life changes? Should they try to get their name removed from the list? How can these possible responses be appropriately evaluated when the opacity of the algorithm tightly constrains the space to reason about their presence on the list at all? Moreover, this contraction of the space of reasons impedes personal or public moral appeals of the rightness, goodness, or appropriateness of algorithmically mediated judgments which is of course why institutions seeking to evade criticism have a strong interest in keeping that space closed off. A prime example of this is the use of proprietary algorithms in judicial systems. As revealed in an investigative series by ProPublica in 2016, uh, many states in the US employ risk algorithms from companies like North Point. Risk scores for individual defendants are often given directly to judges and parole boards with no transparent analysis of their basis or their limitations. Neither judges, nor defendants, nor reporters like Ang Wen have, have access to these algorithms themselves. Nevertheless, Ang Wen and her team were able to demonstrate that the output of North Point's compass algorithm shows clear signs of racial bias, falsely predicting black defendants as reoffenders at almost twice the rate of white defendants. The compass survey instrument does not inquire about the defendant's racial backgrounds, so the bias comes into the analysis via data proxies. Further scholarly analysis has suggested an inevitable design trade-off in these kinds of algorithms between racial parity in false positives and parity in true positives. If this is correct, now here's an opportunity for substantive debate about due process, the presumption of innocence and the particular social harms and costs of false positives that tilt toward defendants of color. But this debate remained closed off or at least severely impoverished because North Point refused to share the specifics of the algorithm that would allow us to confirm the researchers' suspicions about its design limitations. This also hampers the ability of any defendant to present a reasoned argument that its use in their particular case introduced bias while foreclosing the ability of critics to propose and publicly reason with the company about any concrete technical or social fix. The opacity of AI-driven decision systems also impedes the space for moral attribution of responsibility for such decisions and their consequences. Consider Multivac again for just a moment and contrast it with the most uh, recent American elections. For better or for worse, the moderate transparency of American voting patterns through turnout data, exit polls, local vote totals, voter interviews, and other indicators enables somewhat reasoned, if often chaotic and discordant public discourse about which social factors groups and events were most responsible for the outcome. So in the case of the 2016 election, debates about the influence of Comey's October surprise or Russian hacking of the DNC, 
or Trump voting white women or disaffected millennials or absentee Obama voters, the disenfranchised working class, white supremacists and others might not produce immediate social cohesion or reconciliation, but it is important that our clumsy voting algorithm, unlike the fictional multivax, still affords us space for public and private reasoning about the causes and merits of our political and moral choices. And arguably the lack of consensus in that discourse reveals important truths about how just about just how deeply the American political and moral vision has splintered. Now contrast this with a highly opaque use of Cambridge Analytica's illegitimately obtained Facebook user data to mount a secretive operation on behalf of the Trump and Brexit campaigns to manipulate voter behavior through algorithmic targeting of our psychological vulnerabilities, a calculated campaign of cyber political psyops. Regardless of the actual impact of the targeting on US and UK results for which Cambridge Analytica representatives openly claimed credit, we now know that their algorithms were loaded with an unprecedented trove of private Facebook user data, including data of users unwitting friends, and then deliberately weaponized by well-paid psychologists in an attempt to subvert the function of open civic discourse and to encourage voter detachment from the very powers of explicit reasoning that can produce informed political choices. Of course, the algorithms remain proprietary black boxes now blocking informed public reasoning about their effects. Did the targeting persuade people or just manipulate, uh, 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 manipulate them? Uh, did it deceive them? Did the targeting merely feed our existing political convictions and motivations or did it distort them? Now compare such subversive uses of algorithmic power with the less controversial but equally opaque algorithmic models increasingly used for large scale corporate and institutional decision-making such as the sort of hiring software now used by HR departments in most large organizations. There are considerable social and economic advantages to hiring by algorithm. In principle, in theory, the best hiring algorithms can promote a more diverse and well-qualified workforce, bypassing irrelevant factors that human evaluators commonly favor or disfavor, but that do not reliably correlate with candidate quality, such as Anglo-American or male sounding names. Still, hiring algorithms can reflect, perpetuate, and even magnify harmful human biases embedded in their training data. If, for example, a machine learning algorithm is trained on data about previous workers in a given industry and learns that male engineers in the training data set were recruited more often and promoted more quickly, the algorithm might unfairly favor male candidates for engineering jobs going forward. Unless specifically programmed to avoid that pitfall, the AI system built on that algorithm will not consider that the past data is likely to reflect historically ingrained but unjust social biases against women engineers. This was precisely how Amazon ended up with a recruiting algorithm a couple of years ago that it had to scrap because it had learned to downrank applicants who had attended women's colleges or who had served as the president of a women's chess club, but not who had served as a president of just a chess club. Uh, and interestingly enough, Amazon had to scrap it because they couldn't their own algorithm was not transparent enough to them that they could be confident that they had removed all of the proxies that were generating that bias. And the only safe path was to get rid of them. Uh, there's also uh, increasingly uh, adoption of services like uh, that developed by the company HireVue, uh, which uses opaque proprietary algorithms to analyze video interviews of job candidates and project traits of personality and fit with the company based upon existing HR data. If a candidate is rejected by the system based on poor fit with the company's norms, how confident can we be that this is related to a job relevant personality trait, such as quickness to anger or deceptiveness, as opposed to the algorithm's marking of an unusual muscle tick, a, reason, a regional accent, culture specific facial expressions or gestures, body mass, external signs of age or disability, or a race related dialect. All of these are unethical and or illegal reasons to discriminate against an otherwise well-qualified candidate, and yet we have no way of knowing whether HireVue's algorithm discriminates on these bases. Now, you might rightly note that human interviewers routinely discriminate on such bases. This is true, but at least we don't assume humans to be objective analysts and we're able to ask them about their reasons. A search committee can hold a member's feet to the fire to explain the basis of their reflexive dislike or distrust of a candidate that others on the committee find highly qualified. And committee members can discount the member's judgment if they're unable to identify good reasons supporting that dislike. No such process of critical discourse can take place between a human hiring manager and the higher view algorithm. <laughs>
So the space of moral reasons is therefore essential for reflecting upon, appealing and holding ourselves and others accountable for personal and social choices. But the space of moral reasons also has an important forward looking function, namely enabling and encouraging the use of moral imagination in considering and weighing alternative patterns of reasoning and judgment. To reason about my past moral choices is always to invite the moral counterfactual. What if I had done that instead? What if I had chosen or said that instead? Often this begins in the discursive space of reason giving and reason commanding that takes place between self and the inquiring others, or the self and its conscience, or the public and the public conscience. Why didn't we do this? Why don't we want or value that? To answer such questions, we often have to construct an alternative history in which different motivations and thoughts lead to a different decision or valuation. I, or we, in the case of public reasoning, might determine that these alternative motivations and reasons are ultimately unacceptable and incoherent, and thus that I, or we, could not have and still would not do that other thing. But often moral learning and growth takes root in the space of moral imagination, where I, or we, realize that other, better choices were available to us through other and better patterns of reasoning, feeling, and valuation. Here I or we may resolve next time to reason better and do better, to give more discerning sentences, to serve and protect our community more reliably, to hire more fairly, to vote more responsibly, to respond to a pandemic more wisely. It is part of an AI-driven decision system in which the reasoning is the machine automated and opaque part, reducing humans in the system to mere inputs and passive messengers or recipients of outputs. The critical space of moral reasons becomes constricted to the point of vanishing, and with it are lost possibilities for meaningful moral reflection, appeal, responsibility, and imagination. Okay, so now my conclusion. While it's often impossible to design predictive algorithms and other AI decision support systems, sorry, to be maximally fair and accurate across all criteria and contexts, many researchers have suggested ways to make their outcomes more accurate, reliable, and fair from attending carefully to undesirable if unintended social effects that may need to be mitigated, such as disparate impact on protected classes, to shifting the burden of uncertainty from impacted groups to decision makers in order to incentivize AI designers and users to seek out better and more relevant data with which to train the algorithms. As useful as such recommendations might be, they don't directly address either the broader social and ethical questions raised by algorithmic opacity and decision support systems, nor the specific concern I've raised here with respect to preserving the space of moral reasons for human beings. For even if designers and users can be incentivized to promote better fairer social outcomes in the use of AI decision support systems, this might still be done without any concerted effort to make the systems themselves more transparent to users or the public, or to foster personal and public engagement by human reasoners in decision processes of considerable moral and political gravity. Ethically informed design and use of AI-driven decision support systems will therefore require more than fair and accurate and beneficial outcomes. Not even transparency alone will suffice if entry to the space of moral reasons is blocked by other means. Ethical use of AI decision support will in many areas require explicit social recognition of and attention to the intrinsic value of high quality human engagement in moral and political thought and discourse. In practical terms, that means asking new questions of every proposed expansion or new form of AI driven decision support. So we might ask questions like, what existing processes of personal and public reasoning does the system constrain or duplicate? What, if anything, necessitates or justifies these constraints and duplications? Can the system be designed to integrate rather than constrain the space for human moral reasoning? And if so, how? How might the cognitive power of this AI system be used to expand the space of moral reasons? So AI decision systems uh, might be uh, built as initiators, hosts, and mediators of personal and public moral reasoning. Uh, we might build AI decision systems to usefully elicit, track, and highlight patterns of human moral reasoning, highlighting emerging consensus, helping us see or notice novel insights, pernicious tropes, fallacies, equivocations, key turning points, 
So we might have AI decision systems that create more times and places for human moral reasoning to happen, invite more of the relevant stakeholders to participate in it, provide an open digital record and public library of it, and help hold us accountable for having done it. These are all possibilities that remain undeveloped and unexplored. In conclusion, Asimov's multi vac scenario may not be in our immediate electoral future, but very close cousins of it are already taking shape in many other areas of personal and public decision making about morally and politically significant matters of health, justice, labor, finance, education, family, and community life. In more and more of these domains, the personal and public space of moral reasons is contracting as the power and socioeconomic utility of sophisticated machine algorithms expands. The space of moral reasons has been constrained before and in other ways, of course, by priests, kings, oligarchs, demagogues, and family elders who would gladly substitute their moral and political judgments for ours, and by bureaucrats who endlessly invent analog means of rendering such judgments opaque. But at the heart of the modern enlightenment lies Immanuel Kant's urgent call to dare to think for ourselves, a call answered in part by the rise of modern public education and liberal democracies that sought to expand the space of moral reasons and its privileges to the greater share of humanity. Today, we risk surrendering that inheritance to algorithms embedded in helpful AI agents that unlike tyrants and oligarchs, appear to us not as self-interested oppressors, but as benign and neutral servants of our will. Yet in closing up the space of moral reasons by making human operations in that space seem increasingly superfluous, inefficient, and unreliable, their impact on the moral and political maturity of humanity may be no less retrograde. Fortunately, this future is not set for us. Those who would fight to protect and expand the space of moral reasons have a long history of resistance to learn from. And those who came before would tell us that the prize has always been worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was really great. So in the time that we have, let us open it up. So just raise your hand in the virtual or real fashion. Uh, let's see, Chris, go ahead. Um, did we lose Shannon? I don't know, she's here. Uh, sorry, I lost Shannon <laughs> in, my, in my Zoom land. Um, terrific, terrific talk. Thank you so much. I thought it was um, just incredibly um, thoughtful. And I guess I want to ask two questions about the framing metaphor. Um, one about the notion of the space of reasons and one about the notion of constraining the space of reasons. So on the space of reasons, right? One thing we do when we're doing moral reasoning is we're deliberating, we're forming opinions and trying to come to judgments. But another thing we're trying to do when we're doing that moral reasoning is not just to come up with an actually a, a considered judgment, mm -hmm. but to have the considered judgment take hold. It's a question not so much of opinion um, making, but decision making. Right. So um, there's something that's that's missing about that decision making part. What we want is not only to come up with the right answer, but actually to carry it out. Right. We don't right. just want, you know, moral insight. We want moral action. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, I'm, I'm I'm a little bit confused about this, the notion of the space of moral reasonings, because it 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 doesn't quite get that part about what we want to have is the moral reasonings constraining. I mean, in some ways, um, People like uh, right at the end, you said, you know, tyrants of, of various kinds constrain the sports of space of moral reasons. They don't constrain, as it were, the opinion formation of moral reason. People talk about morality all the time. It's just idle chatter because it doesn't decide what happens at the end of the day. So that's my first question about the space of moral reasonings and whether it's capturing that notion of um, decision making power or decisive or authoritative um, character of moral reasons rather than the quality of the reasons themselves. Um, and then the other thing I was just kind of playing with this, and I'm sorry, I can't form this question very well, but the presumption I thought in the talk is that what we want to do is expand rather than constrict the space of moral reasonings. And then it struck me that maybe this is too um, liberal enlightenment progressivist thinking or something like that, but over time, as it were, moral reasoning actually does lead to the constriction of the space of moral reasons. We take a lot of 
apparent reasons off the table as no longer acceptable, right? As it were, normative judgment and deliberation and collective action together hopefully does radically constrict the space of acceptable moral reasons, right? I mean, we just to be, you know, it's simple, obvious things. We don't debate whether slavery is a good thing anymore. Aristotle well, did. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to go back on that. Unfortunately, I've been watching American politics. That's back in play. Um, uh, uh, I don't actually but, think so. I, I, I know, I, Chattel I think slavery is not actually in play. Sorry. <laughs> it really I mean, isn't. I mean, it's a way of ending a conversation. So we have actually constricted the space of more reasons. And we do that through moral reasoning itself. So, so I'm, I'm worried about that background presumption of that we want what we want to do is expand the space of more reasons because there's a whole bunch of places I don't want to expand the space of more reasons. I, I like the normative progress we've had. So let me uh, let me respond to your first question and then your second question. So the, the first question uh, is suggesting that somehow um, the the fact that action is taken on our behalf does not preclude us engaging um, in the kind of moral reasoning that, um, that I'm talking about. Um, and you give the example of the, of the tyrant who you know, makes the decision, um, but it doesn't stop people from reasoning about it. Uh, I, I wanna push back on that uh, actually quite um, robustly for a couple of reasons. Um, First of all, I think if you look at the uh, history of um, countries where uh, tyranny uh, has been um, uh, pursued in a in a really kind of comprehensive and and brutal fashion, um, you you actually do find uh, that the motivation uh, to engage in especially public reasoning. Um, goes away, not only because it's literally not permitted, that is, you know, the, the, the Stasi will come to your house <laughs> if they find that you've been engage, engaging in this kind of reasoning uh, with others, um, but also because there's a kind of fatalism and cynicism that begins to sink in. If you, if you know folks who, you know, and, and you may well, who were raised behind the, the Iron Curtain, um, you know, there's there's a point at which people just become embittered and, and uh, cynical and moral reasoning involves a kind of hope for change that is too painful to engage in. And so it, 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 I'm, I'm not saying that people stop making moral or political judgments altogether, but I absolutely will hold to the view uh, that that space becomes impoverished and constrained in a number of dimensions. I think the same sort of thing for different reasons happens with AI. We're not worried about the Stasi coming to, uh, to our, our, our house uh, because we criticized a decision that an AI system made. Um, but we have a similar kind of disconnect that uh, prevents us from seeing our more reasons as having any uh, power um, or being any extension of our agency. And I've seen this in organizations actually in strange ways uh, for example, in the public sector where uh, AI systems have been used to replace um, decision-making that would normally be made in, um, by, by humans in a kind of social service context. Um, and, and sort of people will, will sort of say things like, look, I, I can't understand this system and it has access to a lot more data than I have. Um, so uh, what is the point of arguing with the system? Um, because if the system is here, it must be because it knows things that we don't. Uh, and we don't even know what these things are. So what is what is the point of trying to, to override this, this algorithmic decision? If it's here, it's here for a reason. Um, and I couldn't possibly tell the difference between a decision it's making that's smarter than mine and a decision that it's, that it's making uh, that's not. Because a decision that I disagree with uh, might just be because this system has access to information that I'm lacking. I have no way of knowing whether it's acting on bad data or not, or whether its reasoning uh, process is poorly designed or not. If it's opaque to me, there's no there's no basis for me to to debate it. Um, and so this kind of uh, this, the same kind of cynicism, I think, and, and kind of fatalism, I think, has has crept in in a, in a number of different contexts. Um, so so that's my response to your to your first question. With with respect to the the second question about the space of more reasons being something that we don't want to expand. 
Um, I think if we think about the space of more reasons as allowing a greater number of moral um, judgments to be viewed as legitimate, I think that's understanding the space of moral reasons um, maybe in too positivistic a, a way, uh, or at least more positivistic than I mean. I don't think the space of moral reasons is like a um, cabinet with a bunch of moral judgments in it and the more different kinds of moral judgments we have in the cabinet, the better. It's more of this weirdly phenomenological and metaphorical notion of space where I have this kind of ability to reflect an ability to consider, an ability to revisit, an ability to imagine, all those things that I was talking about. And I think when we talk about um, also the sort of growth of, of, of moral reasoning, I actually think, and, and we might just have different intuitions about this, I'm not sure how we could settle the disagreement, but I, I, I think actually that moral reasoning has become more nuanced over time and more complex over, over time as it has uh, uh, kind of advanced in, in ways that, you know, at least from a liberal perspective, I recognize as progress. So I think um, when we think about, for example, the, the arguments about how male and female relationships and, uh, uh, and hierarchies ought to be configured, I think those arguments are way more complicated today than they were uh, 200 years ago. I think if you look at if you look at you know Mill writing about you know uh, liberty and 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 the role of women in society, the arguments are are not as nuanced as the arguments that we would uh, see taking place today um, in the in the realm of gender gender politics. So, so, uh, so I mean, I, just I, phenomenologically, I, that means that the near zone in our horizon has gotten more complex, whereas the depth of the horizon has gotten less so. A lot of stuff has fallen off the edge of the horizon, if we want to speak phenomenologically. And the yeah, near, the I, near I just, view is more complicated. I think we have different ways of conceiving the phenomenology, and I we might just have to let that be a difference in the way we perceive this. It, or at least it would have to be, it would take a lot longer than we have in this q and A. I I think, to tease out what the basis is of our differing intuitions on this. Right. So then I guess I'm back to the, is this the right frame? Is this the right metaphor? Hmm. Uh, let's see, uh, Jay and then Jeremy. Let's try to get at least two more in. Great talk. I totally agree about the opacity question. I But I start with a different assumption closer to Whitehead's, which is that um, a lot of social deliberation, moral deliberation gets codified into law, bureaucracy, various kinds of rules that we follow. And so, I wonder if a way to reframe your project or what you're proposing is that we should preserve opac uh, transparency in these systems as long as possible. And the uh, educative benefit of their insights uh, to our deliberation as we decide how much power we want to cede to them. And I think about the experience of doctors with medical diagnostic systems. They were treated with a great deal of suspicion. No doctor ever said, well, I'll just turn it over to my algorithm. But it turns out that doctors, when they get the algorithm's conclusion and then make their own you know, reasoned decision, that they often screw it up. You know, the algorithm turns out to be more accurate than they were in the first place. And so, as you said, eventually we cede more and more authority and trust to that algorithm on the basis of that experience. So, you know, just in a moral decision, you wouldn't want an algorithm to tell you, pull this lever or that lever in the trolley problem without explaining why. You might want one that said, I think you should pull this one if you're utilitarian and this one if you're deontologist, and that would be very useful. But then we have a discussion. We say, well, in general, we want traffic a lot to be utilitarian. So, and, and this is a really life and death thing that happens in a matter of seconds. So we're going to turn it over to an algorithm. We're going to let the algorithm pull the lever on a utilitarian basis because we had this discussion. Mm -hmm. And I don't see, I see that as progress, exactly the kind of progress the Whitehead's talking about that could come about as these tools are used at first as kind of Socratic uh, educative tools and eventually we trust them enough to turn that power over. Yeah, uh, so that's a great uh, comment and I, I have a few things to say to it. I think much of what you're saying aligns with the uh, kind of constructive suggestions I was uh, trying to make in the um, last section of the talk, 
uh, where I talked about the ways that uh, AI systems could uh, be uh, uh, key elements in enriching uh, our moral reasoning capacities. Um, but I also uh, started out by asking some questions about, um, about AI decision support. So I asked, okay, so if what are the processes of moral reasoning that the system is constraining or duplicating? But then I said, what, if anything, necessitates or justifies these constraints or duplications? Um, and I didn't go into that, um, but the reason that's there is because I accept that there are contexts where we will have compelling reasons to offload morally laden decisions to a system that we have adequate reason uh, to trust in that domain. I think in a lot of domains where uh, you're talking about, we actually aren't quite there yet. So for example, you mentioned the medical case. Uh, most of the evidence I've seen suggests that um, we have not yet, despite people's predictions that Watson was going to be making cancer diagnosis for us, right? That turned out to be a massive failure. Um, and, and even with uh, radiography and, and scans, uh, we still, um, based on the most recent evidence I've seen, get be the best performance when we have AI uh, uh, decision support plus human judgment and reasoning happening in concert. Uh, that is that the radiologist alone and the AI system alone both perform uh, uh, less well than when the uh, two systems are, are integrated. Um, so, but, but we might get to the point where that integration in certain domains is no longer necessary. And uh, uh, you gave James some examples of the considerations that might motivate that. Um, so if, if, it's a, if it's a case where it's a life or death decision, we already let things like, you know, ABS in our cars, for example, um, kind of change the way that we behave as, as drivers without our active choice in a given moment, right? And we do that um, for utilitarian reasons, right? Um, but also because humans are just not fast enough at reasoning in a, while driving at you know, uh, 60 miles an hour uh, to be able to make the right kinds of calls when the car's wheels start to slip, right? So I, I think we can imagine a number of different scenarios where we might say, all right, look, the moral reasoning in this case is, has, has now at least been developed to the point where um, the considerations for automating that uh, reasoning in a given domain uh, outweigh the uh, value of remaining kind of actively engaged in this kind of reasoning ourselves. Um, and I, I, I grant that there are a number of domains where we might get there. I don't think those domains are as numerous as, as, as some folks would expect. Um, and I'll go back to your original point about, I'm sorry for, I've got, my eyes are just super dry because it's been a long day and I've been on Zoom all day. So um, we, can, we can think about that uh, example that you, that you uh, gave early on about the kinds of reasoning that we eventually just become confident about that we no longer need to revisit it because it's encoded in law, for example, or other kinds of, of, of norms. I think about things like, the revisiting now that we are doing about um, matters as basic as you know, public health. Um, and the fact that no one seems to remember why vaccines uh, were mandatory uh, in, in schools and a lot of other contexts uh, uh, because of polio or smallpox or any number of things, right? Um, and now we have to kind of re-educate people about why vaccines are um, a socially important duty, a moral duty uh, in certain contexts um, that um, you know, individual choice cannot simply be allowed to, uh, uh, to trample uh, if it means you know, millions of, of people die uh, who didn't need to. Um, the fact that we have to have that conversation again in less than a hundred years, uh, bothers me. Um, the fact that we have to have the conversation again, and by the way, we're losing uh, that conversation um, about whether forcing women to give birth and lose their lives against their will um, to, to bear a child uh, that they uh, didn't choose to uh, uh, conceive or, or bring to term. Well, 
the fact that we baked that one into law, that moral reasoning into law, didn't seem to hold very well, right? So um, I'm not confident that once we make the, you know, kinds of moral decisions that form a social consensus, that we can safely then forget why we made those decisions or lose the ability uh, to, to reactivate those moral reasons uh, as, a, as a public. Uh, because I'm terrified at what I'm seeing in the inability actually of moral reasoning in the public sphere to be reactivated uh, and to take hold in the ways that it did even you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So, so that's why I am acutely worried. We're already in this space where the space of, of moral reasons is impoverished um, in, in many publics. And if technology drives us into even more impoverished and constricted spaces, uh, I think things will get far worse. Uh, Jeremy? Oh, sure. Um... So, uh, first of all, thank you. That was <laughs> especially at the end of a long, a long Zoom day, rich and uh, really enjoyable. Um, I guess I wanted to follow Chris, uh, Chris's question and ask something about the metaphor space of reasons. But unlike Chris, I'm really sympathetic to the metaphor. Um, and I actually want to push you to take it a little further than you did, or at least to ask why you didn't take it as far as I think you should. Um, so, um, I mean, when you had that, you had a slide up, you know, uh, with the headings, the space of moral reasons, where you try to unpack the spatial dimension of, of that metaphor. And you kind of, you had two dimensions, right? This temp you said it was temporally uh, extended and discursively extended. Um, and when, when you cashed out the discursively extended, uh, it, it was really kind of a, a, a public private thing, a best, you know, an I, we kind of talk mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. way of going. Um, now, um, uh, I, I, I really, there's another there's a third dimension of extension right to this uh to the space of reason metaphor and it really comes out more i mean you kind of mentioned the pit crew right of sellers mcdowell and brandon but especially in brandon uh, the third dimension um of extension is really um interpersonally extended as well right which is not just a kind of i we lens but it's really i you right second personally extended very very strongly um and you know in, in his work it's very it's critical because that's the kind of relations of recognition right between yes. right which is creating person which is very central um to understanding that to understanding that metaphor and I, I i was wondering whether you deliberately left that out or you didn't think it was important what and my my hunch here is there is something really interesting of not of thinking about um the lack of this kind of interpersonal relations with with certain forms of of, of ai i mean at the end you know you kind of talked about you know uh, various tyrants and so on well you know the the ability to 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 not recognize people and put them out out of that sphere sounds to me an interesting dimension of of that metaphor and i wondered whether you yeah. had anything to say about it yeah I, I think i just sort of collapsed that uh distinction too too quickly in the presentation and uh, in a way that i think uh, your your comment gives me good reason to revisit um because I, I do think that that interpersonal element is is critical um and i also think there's an aspect of this that uh i mean i'm a virtue ethicist so i actually think that reason is not as um a sort of sterile uh, sterile and kind of a, a barren a logical exercise as it's sometimes uh, presented as right um uh, reasoning is a relational, a moral reasoning particular is, is, a, is, is a relational and social uh, capability um, that involves affect, that involves recognition, that involves, uh, I think, the things that you're gesturing toward. Um, and I think it's important, and I think Brandon, as you say, did a, 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 an excellent job of fleshing that out uh, from, you know, this, this uh, more kind of sterile conception of the logical space of reasons um, uh, that you might uh, see in sellers. Um, and I think McDowell also, you know, it brings that kind of perceptual element to it as well, which as a virtue ethicist and someone who thinks about, you know, kind of the embodied nature of, of moral reasoners and, and, and so forth um, and the affective dimensions of it. I, I think I want to keep all that there. Uh, I think my presentation, however, just glossed over it far too quickly as a way of trying to get to the meat of the talk about how what this all has to do with AI. But I think a better treatment of it would absolutely flesh out that that dimension and think about things like when I talk about the sort of discursive extension, I'm thinking about that as the distance between my reasons and yours. But that's not just a logical distance, right? There's affective distances there and there's sort of um, distances with respect to duty and um, history and all kinds of things um, 
So yeah, thank you, thank you for that because I think that's a really constructive point for me to go back and look at what's missing there. Thanks. Steve, go ahead. Uh, just a, a quick one. Uh, so the stress of this paper is on the black box nature of these processes, the lack of transparency. If let's say we got transparency or sufficient transparency, would that solve the problem as it were? I mean, in other words, would the space of reasons not still be constricted in some way or, or, is, or is that the solution and, and it's all good? No, I think you're right. I mean, I think, I think what I wanna say is that the trend, and, and I think that's why I ended up in that last, I had that last slide, mere transparency is not enough because I recognize that, right? Uh, but I didn't say very much about it. Uh, why, why is transparency not enough? And I think it's for the reasons that you're gesturing at it. We could imagine that transparency going away and a lot of the obstacles to entering the space of reason still being in play. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's another sort of constructive suggestion for me to go back and kind of expand upon that. Um, and whether opacity is really the problem. Um, I mean, I think opacity is today a tremendous barrier to uh, entering into this space of, of reasons in, in these contexts. Um, and I gave the example of, you know, the people saying, well, look, I can't know why, why this system is telling me to cut this person's benefits. So what am I gonna say? I'm gonna cut their benefits. What, what do you want me to do, right? Well, if they could investigate why this person's benefits are being cut, and as it happens, you know, sometimes we do that. So there are some really interesting cases in, um, uh, so there's the KW versus Armstrong case in Idaho, and then the, I forget the name of the court case in Arkansas, but I recently did an event with the main uh, uh, lawyer for the plaintiffs in that case in Arkansas. And in both that and the Idaho case, what the courts um, required is that actually the um, agencies go back and, and kind of figure out, in fact, why these algorithms were cutting these benefits to uh, you know, disabled adults or uh, children receiving benefits. Um, and then once they actually did look into it, these aren't deep learning algorithms. This is not alpha zero being applied in, in Arkansas, right? These are not these like inherently opaque algorithms. These are, you know, glorified Excel spreadsheet, Excel formulas being, you know, uh, used to, to deliver these outcomes. And so it wasn't actually that hard once they opened up the kind of, you know, protective uh, black box uh, that had been built around the algorithm. They were able to go in and see what happened. And it was a mess. The data was corrupt. The, the calculations were, were wrong. Um, it didn't take a rocket scientist to go in and figure out what had happened. And so had that sort of social black box not been there, that institutional black box not been there, um, people could have gone in very easily when complaints started rolling in and said, well, this is all messed up. Why, why, why is this factor missing here? Why, why is this, why are these cells empty? Well, that's why this is happening. So I guess when I speak of the black box, I don't just mean the sort of intrinsic opacity that, you know, people who uh, focus on machine learning algorithms are thinking about, although I think that's a factor. Um, a lot of it is this kind of institutional black boxing um, that keeps us from engaging in this kind of uh, uh, deliberative process. Private property. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't even have to be. I mean, even even if it's not, even if it's, you know, even if it's the states, uh, you, you're, you're not getting any greater visibility into algorithms, algorithms that the Chinese government is making, uh, using to make its decisions either. So it's, it's really about power uh, as opposed to, I think, the private public distinction. Although certainly in, in the US context, right, the proprietary nature of corporate uh, um, uh, intellectual property is a, is a, is a serious uh, obstacle to the kinds of transparency that we would want or the kinds of ability to contest the so, so one of the things I'm really interested about some of the movements in um, the EU and some of the other places towards thinking about principles of contestability, um, where the burden is put on the uh, provider of the algorithmic tool um, to respond to uh, uh, a contestation of the uh, of the judgment. Uh, 
Um, but in practice, it's very hard when these when these forms of opacity aren't remedied. Shannon, if I could make uh, two quick comments, I know that uh, we're almost out of time. I super enjoyed this, really thoughtful and really interesting. Uh, I guess one comment on the framing uh, issue that uh, both Chris and uh, Jeremy uh, raised. Uh, maybe it would be helpful to clarify the distinction uh, between the decline in phrenesis and between the narrowing of uh, moral reasons and why you choose to transition from one to uh, the other. Um, in the AI uh, sort of decision-making context, it's clear why if phrenesis understood as in the sort of Aristotelian ability to weigh particulars and do the right thing at the right time and so on and so on. Clearly, if machines are weighing the particulars now instead of us, there's a de-skilling uh, going on. In what way is that different from uh, the space of moral reasons narrowing or is your view of the space of moral reasons narrowing a version of that? Uh, so that's one comment. And the other quick comment is one other way in which whatever framing we want to choose um, the capacity for uh, this kind of uh, uh, reasoning uh, is narrowed is not just because decisions are made instead of us, but also the platforms on which we talk are AI mediated and um, uh, decrease the quality of the conversation. So for example, Twitter has you know some virtues, maybe even many virtues, but the echo chamber effect that is on it means that you're not too often actually engaging in a patient conversation with somebody that you mildly disagree with, severely disagree with, and so on. So, so actually the ways in which a lot of us exchange information and get our information, uh, even without replacing our judgment, contribute to the narrowing of uh, uh, moral reasoning. Yeah. Um, so let me just agree with your second point. Um, absolutely that, uh, uh, that that is the case. Um, and that uh, that's a that's something else I've written about, you know, but and, but I think it's here not tied into to to the uh, conversation uh, that um, be, because of the nature of the of the, of the focus on on uh, AI. Um, but it isn't just AI in in the social media architecture. It's many other features of the social media architecture that are that are causing this, um, and the kinds of uh, behavioral design principles that are guiding these interactions um, and steering us in particular ways and activating particular prejudices and impulses. And uh, yeah, that's all a huge factor. Um, with respect to the first thing, let me just say, and I can answer it very quickly, that I, I think one of my, um, one of my reasons for, for trying to think of other frames outside of virtue ethics is I, I still find virtue ethics inadequately, uh, um, particularly in the Aristotelian and neo-Aristotelian model, inadequately, um, uh, able, inadequately uh, uh, oriented beyond the individual and the virtue of the individual. So when we focus on the ability to judge particulars, for example, that's conceived as an ability that the individual exercises in their own uh, um, uh, cognitive and moral uh, faculty. Um, and what I like about the way that Brandom developed the space of moral reasons is that it takes it outside of the individual. Um, in, in the ways that um, uh, uh, I think Stephen, you were you were already articulating, right? That it, it becomes um, a social space, a socially uh, articulated and held and, and maintained space, as opposed to something that the individual alone can exercise uh, as a cognitive or moral capability. So I think phronesis is part of this, but I think if we only talk about phronesis, we lose that notion of the of the space as a uh, and was it Jeremy actually, I think, instead of Stephen? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, but um, but that's what why I, I made that pivot. Shannon, thank you very, very much. This was really wonderful. Thank you so much for a fantastic conversation. These are the best and most constructive and thoughtful and probing uh, comments on this talk I've had. Uh, so this was absolutely more than uh, worth a, a late evening uh, uh, here after a long day. I feel actually uh, quite rejuvenated. So I'm gonna go put some eye drops in and uh, rest up but thank you very much for uh for a great uh for a great uh event um perfect and, and talk for, thank well, you very much yeah, have a great night fantastic have a great night everyone bye-bye